my name is Ken Hansen. i um, been around PowerShell. I'll give myself a quick introduction. been around PowerShell for about 14, 15 years now. Um, before that, I was about 10 years at Microsoft doing miscellaneous other stuff. Before that, I was about 10 years in Silicon Valley doing startups, mostly high-performance computing. Um, my, my college job was writing transcendental functions, sine, cosine, arc tangent, and assembly code for risk-based architecture. That was kind of fun. <laughs> that was a hell of a lot of fun, actually. Anyway, first college student was good. So um, I'm not doing that anymore. Um, I'm much lazier than that. Um, and we're simply going to talk about now here. Okay, I'm not an expert at this, and the reason I gave you my little background is because um, I've been leading the PowerShell PM team and much of the PowerShell team for the last 10 plus years. Um, and the past two months, I actually shifted back to an individual contributor role. And as a part of doing that, um, one of the first things was, okay, we've got, to re we've got to fix this LCM thing. And the second thing has been DevOps. What the hell should we be doing at DevOps? And what's Microsoft doing at DevOps? And what's... What should VSCS be doing? What should we do in OSS? And so that's been kind of my gig for the past couple of months. And although we were involved with DevOps before with DSC and Configures Code, it's given me a chance to immerse myself a little more. And so I'm just going to, so instead of doing a bunch of demos this time, we had some demos already with uh, Matthew and, and others, um, sort of walk through the, the, the DevOps tool chain. I might just have sort of some observations about what's going on. Um, and, uh, and we'll explain why I think DevOps is actually real, why you got to get on board. Uh, we'll talk about what I think is happening, some interesting trends that are perhaps not as obvious unless you're deeply enmeshed. Um, there's some sort of cool technology we actually have inside Microsoft because we went and started looking at some of our first parties like O365 and Exchange and Azure and how are they doing this. And so there's some aspects of that I'll share um, without mentioning too many names. Um, and then we'll talk about how you might want to work on your organization and yourself getting to DevOps. Hey, I bet if I turn it over now, it'll be almost right. <laughs> there you are. Um, all right, so that said, da, 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 da. so um, yeah, that's the agenda. I just went through it. Got it? And then final points. So if you have problems, questions, issues, go, Kenneth, you don't know what you're talking about. That's fine. Just raise your hand and don't say those words. Say, I have a different view. And I will feel good about it, and we will all have a good discussion. It's perfectly fine. In fact, please do interrupt. If you want to reemphasize a point, feel free to do that. I would rather have this be an interactive discussion. I'd rather have the room be, you know, half the size, so everybody sort of felt really interested in just raising your hand, having a discussion. I say, if you, there's things you want to emphasize, you want to elaborate a point. If you have a particular experience in one, go ahead. All right. Now here's the issue. Um, I was kind of amused that Jeffrey spent so much time on transformational changes because we had the night before actually written this slide which said DevOps is a transformational change. So now I won't go into too much detail because y'all heard Jeffrey talk about transformational changes, but you have to have that mindset. There's nothing incremental about DevOps. You can increment as you're in DevOps. That's its whole point is increment fast, but you have to be willing to adopt a new mental model. Uh, DSC in some ways even had a similar problem. And the second thing that just a point of emphasize is that if you're ignoring DevOps, it is like managing servers with a GUI in the dawn of, in the day of PowerShell. So don't do that to yourself. <laughs> it's at least as transformational and in fact more so. So if you want to just get a good delta of the difference, that's kind of one way to think about it. As I said, we'll go through about five or 10 minutes sort of, of random observations, then we'll hit the next, uh, the next section. Um, companies and you, can experience huge gains from adopting DevOps. What does that really look like? Let's take a look at it. So this is actually a chart that I found really interesting that came out of uh, uh, Puppet's uh, annual survey. But what you'll see is that on the right-hand side are um, people who don't do DevOps, <laughs> low IT performers. On the left side are high IT performers, people who are, who are deeply enmeshed in the DevOps culture and working on it. And the middle is the, the medium. And you measure them across deployment frequency, lead time for changes, mean time to recovery, and the change failure, which I particularly liked, right? The change failure. So what are the actual numbers? 200 times more deployments. Do you think that's gonna make a difference? You know, it might, okay. 2,500 times shorter lead time. So the difference be delta between when you get input and actually your ability to do something about it. 
right? This goes back, this is how Dell used to make their money back in the long time back, right? Because they had such a much faster spin cycle, right? Manufacturing, they care about manufacturing turns. It's the same idea here. 2,500 less lead time, 22% less unplanned lurk. Now, I thought that was kind of interesting. You might think because you're moving quicker, you actually have, you actually don't have as well planned work, but it turns out, no, 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 you actually spend more of your time doing planned work. And I think that's partly because you can, you, you have a place to put the plan that's close to the work getting done. Does that make sense? Kind of like you'd see with Agile, but, but a little different. And therefore, you're spending more time on planned work. This was a great number. Mean time to recovery, right? As we start talking into the future, it becomes less and less about reliability, which is, as Jeffrey would say, oh, my server, you know, and becomes more about robustness, which is fire up the barbecue and put another server on, right? So just... Do your, do your business that way. Um, so this 24 times recovery is how, how, how robust you are. It's not about reliability, it's about robustness. Um, and ironically, there's still three times lower change rate failure, meaning you're much, much, much less likely to screw up. Now, isn't that interesting? We're moving how much faster? A couple order magnitudes faster and we're screwing up less. And I, and, and I, it's important in my mind to get these numbers and focus why I spend a little time on it because otherwise you're just, you, you don't know what's motivating it. Oh, and by the way, everybody else is happier. Your employees are happier. Um, no, actually there's an argument that says no. Let me, let me, let me speak to that for a second. Um, the question was, hey, look, but since everything's automated, when you do make a mistake, isn't that, Horrible, because now it goes everywhere so fast that you're going to be busted. We're going to talk about that a little bit, how you actually work on that, prevent it. In reality, because people have that pretty much in focus, um, and the recovery time is so much faster, then in fact your impact is much less. The impact for any given mistake is much, much less because you recover so much quicker and you have fewer of them. That's right. Now, what you've also got is... Um, there's another thing I want to mention about that. The other point is that you're making frequently more incremental changes, right? And because you're making a more incremental change, the impact, maybe that's what you meant by scope, but the impact of that change is less. Now, if you screw up your DevOps infrastructure, yeah, then you could, you could hurt things. Don't do that. All right, but, but you know, that's the, that's the little dirt. That's right, make a note. Exactly, yeah. You still have more more failures? Yeah. Or is it that they actually have, have less failures overall? They have... Here's where the numbers don't add up for me. Because I actually tracked back to the Papa guys and said, okay, explain this to me. Um, and Because they did some evaluation about the, the costing. And their assertion was that you end up... You do end up spending a little more time in failure mode, but you recover so much faster you don't notice it. But I'm not sure that... I, I think there's actually more drill down to do on that, so I don't mean to, I mean to oversell. My point being, pretty simple, it says, look, um, not, only are you, not only are you getting all this benefit, your employees are happier, but as we used to work back in the days, I said back in supercomputing, we said, look, um, in order to get someone to do something substantially different, you need at least a 10x improvement. You ever heard this one? If you don't give them 10x, they're not going to do anything different. It just turned out to be a standing rule that we had in the supercomputer computing industry, it came up because I was in parallel computing, 64,000 processor node things, writing the compilers for that, that required a little different language than it did to just run against one, one, uh, one processor. Make sense? But the only way you could get it is if you had at least a 10 to 20x price performance advantage, then people were willing to spend that, that effort to learn something new. Here, we've got a hell of a lot more in 10x. That's why it's going to be, that's why it's inevitable that it'll be adopted. A few more observations. Hope I haven't uh, put people to sleep with this overall uh, uh, concept, but I think it's useful for people to get this in focus as you start to look at your careers. Um, I would, we would say, everybody familiar with this market technology adoption lifecycle curve? Yeah? No, yes, that's a yes? Okay, good. Um, you know, and there's the great chasm that we all fall into. Jeffrey Moore made the chasm uh, book. It's good. If you just took a look, our perception, and this is a rough perception. Your perception might be different, um, although I vowed it with a few people that seem to be in the know. 
a year ago or a year and a half ago, you know, 14 to 20 months ago, that's kind of where DevOps was. It was still in the innovators and early adopters. We would say today it's crossed the chasm. We have 85% of companies, according to Sumo Logic, actually now have or plan on having this year DevOps projects. So, and what that really means is that in another year or two, it's there. It's moving very, very, very quickly. Now, it is true that people at the, uh, the farther edge here might not still be as innovative as people down here, right? Google does some crazy crap down here, right? And others do some interesting stuff down there. Um, and maybe you're, maybe you're just doing CI, CD pipelining here, but you're not going to be, but, but that's kind of where it's at. So um, sort of keep that, that trend in focus if you get sort of the velocity. Um, and this leads me to my final observation. Yes. I think that a lot of companies are uh, still in silos. Uh, still in silos. silos yeah. Yes. IT. So uh, reorganizing this in, in one or two years is, in my view, impossible. Yeah, so let's talk to that a little bit. Um, how do I say that right? It depends on the. No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a fair, it's a fair point. Um, there's a difference in, in this graph for this idea, it's not whether or not the company has completely embraced DevOps as a whole company. But what we're finding is even with the larger companies, that they have elements of that company that are now headed down the DevOps path and they're moving on it. Does that make sense? Now that which is... Uh, automation is a foundation of DevOps, but it is certainly not DevOps. No, no, I would say they go more. Yeah, but if we, this would, I would assert in this case, the impression, this is an impression, but the impression is that more than uh, this, I'm confident on. We have people already crossing the early majority, a fair number of them actually. Companies that you would not be expecting are doing it. That's why 85%. This might be more of a guess, but it's been moving so quickly, and as I talk to the companies, oh, I'll, I'll show it another slide, but as you actually talk to the companies, one of the guys says, here's my problem. The problem is I'm having an existential crisis, meaning I'm not sure my company's going to exist. I mean, we have JCPenney, which is a pretty darn big company, just go out of business, you know what I'm saying? Amazon is taking names, <laughs> and, right? And so over time, and they'll get into the financial industry too, all these other industries where people think they're safe and secure, they're not. They're just delusional. So it's not that some elements of the world won't move slower than other elements of the world, but if you take a look even at large companies, there will be a substantial effort and a pivot towards DevOps that will reach the CIO's C-level uh, discussions, I would say, easily in the next year. In fact, I would bet that most of them are having. Now, that doesn't mean they're still not in silos. It doesn't mean they still don't have problems. We're going to talk about that last bit, which is how do you move? Because there is this, there is this train that's coming, but you're right. It's, hitting, it's going to hit a wall of, of existing silos. So it's going to be a little interesting to see what happens there. Um, however, I do feel, and maybe your experience will be different, but you're going to get on the board, the DevOps train, or eventually it's going to run you over. It's just similar to the, the adoption curve of PowerShell, except it's much quicker. If you just take a look at how fast PowerShell came on board, it's taken a long time, right? It's been over a decade, you know? But it's only been a decade, you know? And so these guys are moving at least twice as fast. And, it's, and the benefits are even more. All right, I'm just saying. So uh, let's talk a little about what we mean by DevOps and what we think is actually happening. So if you take a look at the Wikipedia definition of DevOps, this is what you get. We have code, build, test, package. It talks about that release. It's got the little circle. Everybody familiar with this sign? Yep, isn't that beautiful? It's awesome. As we started to look at it a little more, um, we said, well, maybe it's actually looking a little more like this. I don't know if you, how that shows up pretty well here yet, but the current DevOps pipeline is a little more complicated. We added security and we separated provisioning, which is essentially infrastructure versus deployment, putting the bits out there. And oh, by the way, we got this insight thing. We got a little more crisp about what that means. Oh, that's not just uh, the application. We actually want to understand how the application is being used, 
how the infrastructure is being used, what the usage of the actual uh, opportunity is, the robustness, its health. So we kind of added a few things and there's, oh, there's compliance, a few things come into play, but this is what I would call the modern CICD pipeline era. That's kind of that, that side. And as I say, some of the people will be starting on there. And there's a lot of tools to do this. I actually had somebody read this the first time I put this up on a screen and he corrected one of my errors. But I think it's right now after him because he was, because he was very precise. He took a photograph and spent like an hour on it. So anyway, um, so, so there's just a lot of tools and these aren't all the tools. These are just representative to give you some sense as the people involved uh, in the various tooling aspect. Here's what we see beginning to happen though. And that's that people are pivoting more and more towards what I'd call scenarios. What am I trying to get done with this stuff? Does that make some sense? What am I trying to do? And so they're starting to look at phased exposure, right? How do I actually phase this thing out so that I can get, I can get the exposure I need without screwing people up so I can not make the big error? Right? How do I avoid making errors? How do I handle experimentation and flighting? Similar, but how do I make sure I'm getting feedback on the features? How am I, how I, how am I rolling this out? Um, how am I, how am I testing? These, this ability to create a test environment is great, but it turns out it's really, really, really hard for a test environment to, to replicate a production environment completely. You just, you don't get there. And so what they're doing in many cases, they're beginning to go direct into, uh, into production as their test environment, but they use all the constraints of the flighting to actually prevent screw up. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, feedback loops, how do we get, this is an interesting one. Um, uh, because I work now with the App Insights team who just joined OMS, right? And so they have a, a series, they look at logs and they make analysis and they're doing some stuff. and uh, and. And part of their question is, okay, how do we hook in directly into VSTS and we have ideas on what's going to happen there and actually start providing automatic uh, feedback both on the monitoring, on this monitoring side, but also on getting feedback direct to the developer on, on areas where their usage is failing or succeeding. How do we file bugs and, and issue in GitHub, right? So the monitoring, you could picture it this way if you're, if you're already into DevOps. How should the monitoring actually open an issue on GitHub when your usage is off, right? Or when the health is off, is there something there? So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Um, fault injection, Simeon Army, as you guys know, um, I won't go through all of these things. Uh, the immutable microservice, we talked a bit about that. But in my mind, and this is just the way we sort of phrase this modern CICD line here is essentially that left piece, <laughs> right? That's what you sort of got by the time you're done. And it's just sort of interesting, get your, so as you pivot to that, the things you worry about change, the technology you look about change. You're not worried just about moving quickly. You're not just about the, um, the, the tooling for CICD, but okay, what's the, what's the end customer result? Now you've all seen this before, right? Here's another, so this is the second thing to sort of make an observation on. You've seen something like this, right? It's like, okay, there used to be Agile and Agile was about getting the business and the developers together and iterate quickly. And then we changed this DevOps thing, which had a wall between them. And we said, let's get them to operate quickly. And we'll make a case back to, back to your point, which is um, this guy, actually Scott, his name is Scott. He's in this hyper-competitive industry and he's going, look, Macy's closing, JCPenney's closing, these guys, we need to be ready to respond or we can't be caught flat-footed, we will cease to exist, is kind of his observation. I think more companies are going to start understanding that over time. Another company, the operations team is way underwater. Um, why? Because they got all these dev teams that want everything and they just could not scale. So again, they had to adopt more of a DevOps approach. So essentially, a DevOps gets adopted not because it's cool, although that's why we do it. <laughs> it gets adopted because it makes a huge difference to the bottom line and to the survivability in some cases of an industry. Now, some industries will be, you know, more immune to, uh, to change than others. But here's the trend that I think is kind of interesting. There's two, two more observations on this. And that's, and you don't need to read each one of these things, um, but essentially what's happened is they used to say, well, okay, we're going to do DevOps, and they officially did config as code, right? Are we familiar with that? It's their first step. And then maybe they said, okay, okay, there's this other thing that operations have been doing for us. They've been building out an infrastructure for us. So maybe there's infrastructure as code, right? And what I'm observing is, no, 
they're just peeling the operational onion. Ops has been doing a lot of stuff for them for a long time. Dev doesn't completely understand everything Ops does. And what they've done is they've, buy, they've bit off the one piece they understood and say, okay, that's DevOps, that's configure as code. Okay, well now I'm gonna have to do infrastructure as code. Oh, oh, policy, okay, now I gotta do policy as code. You know, networking is good. Security. Now there's DevSecOps, right? Become the, it's just another one of these things where, oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, that's important too. You know, and so you're just going to go through this list. So if you want to see where the industry's headed, in my opinion, just picture what operations does. <laughs> kind of make a list like I've made here. And here I've added some stuff. You know, we've got, we got release, but in this case, there's specific ways of doing release. Phases, rings, flighting. It's a little different than what we've done before. So it's not that we're going to do things the way we used to do in operations. It's that the same problems have to get solved over time. Is everybody with me there? All right. So that's kind of one observation. Patches, updates. Whoever who thinks about patching in DevOps? Oh, we just throw it away. Yeah, but it's in DevOps pipeline, if you, you actually want to patch it back up on the immutable architecture in particular, if you're using uh, containers. Um, and, and to put your head around it just a little more, um, there's a company, uh, Etsu, I believe it is, who um, the first day a developer or a employee starts there, this first day, he is going to put code into production, period. <laughs> That's your job. You sign up, you come in, your job before you leave today is put code in production. Now, in many companies, he'd be here a full year and he'd be dead, right? <laughs> because he would never get home. It wouldn't work. Um, but think a little bit about what that means. That's right. You have to sort of think about, you have to think about what that means in order to be able to do that. That means that your tooling has to be intuitive enough that he can pick it up, he can understand it, right? He's got to get the computer. He's got to be able to get the tooling understood, got to be able to make the change. She's got to be able to understand how to check in the bits and then having checked them into the right place, something has to flow beyond there, and it's got to flow in a way that doesn't mess up the universe, <laughs> right? That becomes a hard problem. Pretty soon the stuff flows, but you don't want it to, right? So, so how, do you, how can you envision doing one of those? And if you start thinking through that problem, you'll get a, some sense as to where DevOps is headed, because that's, that's the problem you're trying to actually solve, um, doing that in a robust way. All right, one of the ways you do that is it stopped working. Hello, hello, hello. Did that work? Okay. And now the whole screen is completely lost. That's kind of fun. Hold on, one more try, and then we're going to. Ah. Mm, no, oh, well, big deal. So, um, We'll do with whatever it is I'm looking at. I'll look up here. Um, one of the key elements of DevOps, and this goes back, this is kind of a chain on that, that explosion of the operations stack a little bit, is that it requires everything, absolutely everything, as code. And there's a reason. Why does it require everything as code? And by code, I don't necessarily mean a programming language, right? Code could be text. It was, you know, it's JSON's a thing. The, the language du jour is actually YAML. Um, but it doesn't matter. DSC, you know, looks like code, a configuration, doesn't matter. But the question is, is you need some sort of declarative definition um, and why? And these are kind of interesting objectives. Well, okay, source code control, repeatability, review, human readable pipelines, that's kind of important because you want to know what you screwed up. Oh, you want to, it's nice to have editors. You can actually not just deal with binaries, right? Um, I, somebody phrased as known and searchable information you can find out. It enables automation measurement small iterative improvements, and the most important for me, the ones I've underlined, says intergroup shared artifacts. And what that means is, if you give me, if you tell me to do something, that's one level of uh, fidelity, right? If you are able to drop the code or the text file into my pipeline that flows naturally through my pipeline, that's a whole new level of accuracy about what you want to have happen. Make sense? So the great thing about shareable artifacts is that if you're using the same things, so you're using a, I don't know, a DSC configuration, config data, or a, a, or a YAML file, that I can give it to Bob, and Bob 
knows exactly what to do as Sue knows how to do it. And it's the same thing. And we talk the same language because part of the problem between these silos that you mentioned are that the language is different. The expectation is different. But if you're using a shared tooling, in fact, your language shifts, your whole discussion shifts. It's like, oh, did you give me the YAML file? Yes, I did on Friday. Okay, no, whatever. Actually, you wouldn't have that discussion. You'd just check it in. But regardless, you could have a discussion about it. Um, so, and the other thing is that it, so it enables this, um, what I would call agility while maintaining integrity of the system overall. So without that, it's an opaque system and you can't handle it. So everything is code. And that means, again, go back, say, how do I do policy as code? I don't know, I haven't thought about that. How do I secure it as code? Ask yourself all those kind of questions. All right, automation, it's just obvious. You're gonna fail if you don't automate. Um, <laughs> the other thing worth noting, you're, you're all PowerShell people, I'm not gonna go into that one. Um, um, uh, three more things kind of worth observing. One is that these difficult text representations, some of the JSON descriptions are kind of opaque and AWS is bleh, and everything else are being replaced with something higher level. And if you take a look at what Docker's done with Compose or what Terraform has done, then in fact, in some ways they have taken it up to the next level of, of abstraction. Does that make sense? I don't know if people have used, have anybody, who's used Terraform here? Who's used Docker or Compose here? All right. This is fun. <laughs> There's so much more for you to do in your life. Aren't you happy? Um, so, there's, there's more opportunity to get even more done. Um, so, so these are just, these, these are just if, if, how many people have used an ARM template? All right, good. That's all right. Uh, yes, I've got one of those. That's right. They're, they're kind of low level and they're a little hairy to get right. And what you're looking at is new levels of abstraction to say, okay, you don't have to know which SQL, just tell me I need a SQL server. All done. And we'll take care of the connection for you, right? It's that kind of an abstraction where things just become, again, a 10x easier easier to define. And so that's the trend. People are headed there. And we're um, looking, actually internally, we're looking at, you know, how, what, how should we play there? PowerShell has this ability to do DSLs. What if we, well, it's an experimental ability. What if we actually, you know, flesh that out with the community and should we create some DSLs here that are d domain specific languages, what I mean by DSL. How do we create some domain specific languages that might make you actually able to use the ISE or Visual Studio Code to actually generate an ARM template underneath it or a series of phases actually underneath it. Um, so I might be blowing it into the future, but I just want to give people a sense of, of direction. Um, it's true, these objectives, this, you know, the source code, the control, the intergroup shared artifacts. And this is something that the, um, my compatriot, Peter Provost, the robe and sandals guy, right? He's the guy who comes on and says, oh, this is DevOps. Um, he insists I put this in, which says, look, the objectives are key. It's just the only known way to achieve these objectives is with everything as code. If there was a different way, we'd use it, right? It's just, just what it is. Um, yeah, I'm done. Uh, level of coordination kind of depends, kind of. I would say the level of coordinated automation, I differentiate automation from coordinated automation, but the level of coordinated automation in many ways sort of represents how far down this DevOps path you've probably come. Um, and we'll start in different ways. All right, I'm gonna land on it just, uh, this piece will repeat some of it just to make sure. Um, shared artifacts via ops as code enables exchange of artifacts between people, easy exchange. The integration of processes and requirements, because I've got a process and now the requirement can just come in, into that process, insert itself and flow through a pipeline. You with me? A little bit? Okay. <laughs> um, I might need to do more examples. It enables this common language and this was pointed out by somebody else. It, and it um, lowers the level of lock-in because now you can take this office code and move it either between clouds or on-prem or you know, wherever, wherever you want to. Does that make sense? If you take a look at the last, uh, the, the BMW uh, uh, example, you know, he could do VMs or on, or on prem. And part of that, of course, they had to do some back end work, but part of that was because of this idea of artifacts, in my opinion. So, um, all right. And there, just for fun, some cool tech. So, if I haven't totally lost you, that's okay. <laughs> that's all right. I haven't meant to. Um, if you have questions, do raise them. We'll chat about it a bit more. There is some cool stuff going on. Now, this is just stuff within uh, uh, Microsoft itself, various first parties between SharePoint Core and Exchange and, and others. Um, but it's worth sort of getting your head around. There's this notion of, 
All right, I'm going to do the second one before I do the first. There's this notion of a feature flag, right, which says, I turn on it. You, you, you implement a new feature, right? And that's great, but we, want to, we don't want to ruin everybody's experience if you didn't do a good job. And so you end up putting essentially an if around your feature code, and then we have a configuration. And so now we actually deploy all the bits. It's called a dark launch. People are familiar with the term dark launch, right? Okay, I've got like five heads not in. So um, a dark launch says nobody can see it, but you've now deployed the bits out across the entire infrastructure. So they're there. They're worldwide. But you haven't turned on any change yet. And then it's just a config switch. It's just a configuration change, an instantaneous change to turn on the feature and to turn it off again if you need to, right? <laughs> so you can turn it on and... The next intelligent piece is to make sure you only turn it on for a certain set of people. This goes back to the rings and the flighting, right? So in the case of, um, oh, I won't tell you which one. In the case of one of these guys, um, they actually, they keep adding more rings to avoid problems. Um, they, um, uh, they start with, I think their lowest is 5,000 users, and then they go to 10 million users, and then they're at a, 50 or 60 million, and then they start blowing out, and there's some laggards. They actually go all the way. So you got like five or six different rings, right? And, and they give it a little bit of bake time, and we'll discuss the bake time, good or bad. Um, you know, maybe it's there 24 hours, right? Um, and there's some technology to improve that. Maybe it's there 48 hours to make sure it actually works, and then, okay, that's good. We'll go to the next ring. Make sense? And you can automate some of that decision, or you can decide you're going gonna to make it. We'll talk about ways to automate it. Um, so, so that's kind of the idea of feature flags and flights. Kill switches are like them, but different. <laughs> a kill switch is also a configuration change that changes where the code is, if the code is executed or not. But in this case, it's not about a feature. It's about a bug, right? It's at the lowest level. A feature is a pretty big thing. It doesn't have to be a, a fast system. But a kill switch says, look, I'm going to have a lot of these things. And so, and so anytime anybody fixes a bug, there's just a new code path. Just give me all the old and the new code path at the same time, and I'll switch them off and on. So they don't launch darkly. They launch all the way out. If it's deployed, it's deployed. It's there. So it's a little different mental model, and it's actually the switch it off. In fact, I have a – if you look at the slides later, you'll see I have a, a, a differentiation between them. Um, I'm not going to go into it since I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. Um, so, but you can, you can see it later. Um, okay, now this is a fun one. I told you a little about the DSL, right? So um, before I, I, I'll pop down here to the DSL, let's hit a little bit. There is a pull request to actually improve the PowerShell ability to create a, 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 a domain-specific language. Feel free to comment on it, look at it. There's also an RFC. Um, comment on it, look at it. This is something that we want to continue looking at. It's a long-term thing for us. It's a slow burn, but something we it has made sense for a long time to do DSLs. So we did desired state configuration. We kind of almost did it as a domain-specific language, but didn't really complete the internals in a way that would allow other people to do one. So this is about how do we actually make it possible for you to create a language that you like. It's kind of a cool idea, and it turns out to be really, really, really useful. Um, and you'll, you'll find they, – they're all over, by the way, DSLs are. So, um, uh, but having a parser do a domain-specific language is particularly nice um, because then you've got all the editing, uh, debugging potentials. Um, let's talk about the third bullet now, aberrant deployments. This is where it gets interesting. Um, so one of the really important elements of, uh, these, of, of the future of DevOps is this hot monitoring and cold monitoring, hot path and cold path. Um, and hot path means that, uh, you know, it's, it's at the instant, right, as things happen, I have the, um, I know exactly what's happening to all my environment, and if there's an alert or a failure, I can stop future deployments, or I could roll back. I could roll back by how? Turning off the, flipping the config switch, right, so the feature goes off. That's my rollback, <laughs> right? right? Real quick, real simple, real safe. Um, so, so you can even begin to automate that. So if I throw any alert, I'm going to turn that thing off, right? Um, and you can begin to get that in, in focus. What you find, though, is how do you know that you're okay getting to the next level? And you got a few choices. 
Well, certainly you run tests, and frequently people run tests, but they're not, you can't, you can't test everything. You end up doing unit tests, which we call modern, modern testing uh, for us is more about tons of unit tests, and then you're starting to test more in production with the right kind of monitoring in place, so you know when you're failing or succeeding. You can turn yourself off and save yourself. So, um, so that's the, the monitoring piece. Okay, I got hot monitoring. I can turn myself off if something goes wrong. Cold monitoring is, cold path is more doing analytics after the fact, like a week later, whatever it is you want to analyze behavior. Um, but here's the problem. Each one of these first parties is adding a few more rings and a few more phases to their deployments because they want to stage it more gradually because somebody made it through a phase and got to a bigger one and blew something up they didn't like. Does that make sense? So they add, oh, 24 more hours at a new phase, and that'll solve our problem. Now, they know it doesn't, but it diminishes it. What we find, Dane, um, is that, and the reason they do that is because they don't have 100% coverage of their monitoring. Right? The guy said, if I had 90 to 95%, good monitoring and analysis, then I could probably go automatically. I could probably trust myself. As it is, what you're really doing when you put something out and then wait is you're waiting for the users to test it. Right? That's what you're really doing. <laughs> you're waiting to say, we're going to let them test it and tell us, right? <laughs> or hopefully a monitor will tell us, but we don't really know. And so, and so what they're doing is, no, no, let's shift this behavior. So there's an effort now underway to say, what if I could detect aberrant deployments? Deployments that are different, right? That no longer follow a standard deviation, right? If you will. And so, what if I said, okay, let's throw a deployment out there? Um, I already, I already have one out. I've had had this, you know, I don't know, project Kenneth's great software service out for, you know, months. I um, I add a great new feature to it, um, and I stick it out there with a feature flag enabled. That's great. I start with a small number of people, and this little thing says, okay. At this stage, with this set of flights, is it behaving the same as the last one? It's not asking. With monitoring, you have to know what you want to measure. And then you have to have a threshold, right? And it's human threshold. And they screw up. There's an interesting case there. The guy set it to be 100,000. It should have been 1,000. And so you can picture the result. It like, cost them days to get that thing fixed, right? Okay, there's a threshold. In this case, it's not the threshold. The threshold's automatic. It just says, look, you're either, you're either within my expected range, operational range or you're outside of it. I determine the operational range, not because you're a genius and you tell me. I determine the operation because I've measured it and I've seen it for myself. Make sense? Now, what they're finding, and just to give you a sense of the, the state of that technology, um, what we're finding is that their, their little bot that does this is, uh, is over-signaling, which is better than under-signaling. It's over-signaling by about uh, two times. On the other hand, it's catching five to six more problems, five to six times more problems before they actually get to the next phase. So it's doing a better job, although it's over-signaling. And you can picture how you can dial it back, right? Sort of, oh, okay, I'll be a little less sensitive to that measurement next time. You can just sort of get that you know, mental model. Anyway, so that's kind of like some cool technology that's landing. Uh, people might want to be aware of. Uh, let's see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's it. Flighting. Yes, we already talked about that. Um, Oh, I just wanted to make, this is just my reminder to myself in case there's anything else I needed to cover that I hadn't covered yet. Feels like I've hit most of that. Uh, the feedback loops with hypothesis-driven development is really an interesting area. It's pretty, pretty futuristic, though, so I don't know what to say. Okay, let's talk about the path to DevOps for a bit. Um, so that's sort of technology. That's sort of looking to the future. Here's kind of some interesting trending stuff if you want to get a look at it. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that each companies are at radically different places. We have people that are, as we said, you know, your first day on the job, you will deploy production code. That's one company. You have companies over here going, somebody told me there was this thing called DevOps and I should learn something about it. Right? Totally different places. People who think they're doing DevOps are frequently kind of like right here, and they're doing CI, CD automation. That's kind of their level. Maybe they've done config as code. Other people say, hey, I'm up to infrastructure as code. A lot of those are beginning to get started, not all are completed. They're kind of here, right? And there's other people that say they're sort of 
kind of le left past that. So that's okay. So the question just says, where are you at? Where are you personally at? Where's your company at? Get in mind. Now I want to pop up a little bit. Um, and because I've talked so much about technology, um, this, we now need a discussion around how to bring companies along. How do we actually construct an organization that can handle with DevOps? Um, because it turns out that the hardest problem with DevOps is not the tooling we've talked about, it's the people. It's the human element, right? And that's the challenge. And so the DevOps in particular all splits itself up in people, processes, and tooling. We've talked a lot about tooling. In terms of the people, we'll land it just for two seconds. Um, Cross-disciplinary teams collaborate and have a stake in the entire process. That's key, right? They have to have a, a shared stake, and otherwise they stay in their silo because they're, it's not their problem, it's his problem, you know. Um, uh, and the intent is velocity and quality. People, therefore, must radically change their behaviors. You can't keep doing what you're currently doing. Uh, and there are some ways to succeed and fail. We'll go through that in more detail next. Um, again, shared accountability and everything, everything is code, everything. Okay, so again, it's just kind of for your reference, but, it's an, but you have to think about it that way. All right, there are team structures that work and team structures that don't work. And I s borrowed this, I was gonna say stole, but I borrowed. <laughs> um, and it's, it's attributed. Um, the top one on the, in the title is the latest I don't like it as well as the original, so I put the original there. The, origi the original's actually got fewer topologies, and I think as CRISPR, I thought he did a better job of nailing it. And then everybody said, oh, well, my company's just a little bit different. And so I was like, yeah. So I'd go to that one. But here's my summation of it. There's stuff that doesn't work. Silos, right? There's stuff that kind of works, but not really long-term. We'll talk about this one again later which is a separate DevOps entity with operations and developer. Now this can work as a transition to get you to somewhere else. As so you have a set of team that actually understands it and then educates people on it, okay? But as a permanent place, it's a disaster because it just creates another wall. Oh, it's a dev, to the DevOps, to the ops, right? Doesn't work. It's a little more porous wall, but it's still a wall. And then there's the other one is we don't need no stinking ops, right? It's like, yeah, we're devs, we're gonna do it all. Who needs operations? In fact, they don't even recognize that that right bucket exists, that's why it's dotted. It doesn't really exist in their mind. Oh, you know, I just deploy my code. Um, so that, that, that doesn't work either. Okay, what does work? These work, let's talk through them a little bit. I probably should have put them up one at a time, but oh well. Um, Top left says, this is, this, is, this is Nirvana. This says, we have an operations team that has a set of expertise and capabilities. We have a development team that has a set of capabilities. And they share artifacts and information and awareness and processes right in the middle. And so if I have a new policy that I need enforced, I simply give them, I simply check in my policy file. It flows automatically through the dev pipeline. As they generate their container, it's already deeply embedded. It goes out in the system according to the infrastructure that we've laid out that follows all the, all the, all the rules that we've, we've both agreed upon and are now encoded as text uh, that anybody can look at and critique. That's a great place to be. Um, I'll talk in my next slide about how one might want to get there and some, some ideas on steps. Um, the other place that's great to land on is the right side, top right, type two, which is essentially fully embedded. Now, uh, let me jump back to the type, type one for a second. Type one, it turns out that it's kind of a lie. Um, it's accurate, but there's like about five to a hundred of those like yellow circles and one blue circle in most cases, right? You end up with multiple dev teams all working against the same operations guys. That's the way it really looks. On the right circle, there's really one. And so a place like Facebook or something like that would end up doing that kind of operation because they're really just sort of one thing. They're not completely, but that's kind of how they would think about themselves. Um, so I, 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 this is a good place to go. I, I'm just not as convinced that many companies will go there. Um, this one kind of is like the, the other one where there's no us, but not really. They're simply saying that we've actually taken elements of it and moved it in. So you st it's kind of like this, but in this case, we've actually sort of only done parts of it, have actually sort of gotten embedded, and there's still a tight exchange, and we recognize that these are actually operational personnel. Um, the uh, fourth, eh, 
is is a little interesting also it says hey um what if i go out here and i and i and i get infrastructure as code or i i leverage the web or somebody else to actually solve my problem for me and interoperate with my operations team and that's kind of a that'll that'll work we're told um and then there's this one which we said before didn't work a special devops team that just thinks of itself as DevOps and nobody else. These guys are still ops and these guys are still dev and still living in their own little silos. You know, that's a fine place to start. That's how you start. In fact, I would assert um, that, that if you just sort of go left to right, uh, this left-hand column was kind of like, okay, you could start on either one of those places. Use somebody else infrastructure's code, so you eventually start to just get the practices and habits out there, and you start to delve the toolings. I mean, I mean, let's get a little practical for a second. You take a look at I was at uh, LinuxCon ContainerCon in October in the EU, and um, Berlin. Now that I think about it, Germany. Anyway, um, and um, and it was interesting to watch uh, one of the one of the companies there said, "Yeah, we're starting to do containers, but here's the way we're doing it." We're just replacing VMs with containers. <laughs> They're just as long lived. <laughs> They're just containers instead of VMs. And it was interesting as to why he was, <laughs> well, I hope maybe not because he hasn't been around that long, because then the intent was just to get used to the tooling. I'll change one variable, I'll do the containers, I'll understand all that tooling. Okay, now I'll try to do the next step. Does that make sense? And so, and so, Look, the left-hand side is a fine place to start. Just realize that's not where you want to end. Does that make sense? So start there, and then you might want to go to more of an infrastructure service. It's okay, we got a little more shared ops. And it's kind of, in, in my mind, that's a step towards getting just a smooth collaboration because that's, in fact, that, that function becomes, in fact, the smooth collaboration piece. It sort of becomes merged into the bubble. So I don't know if these bubbles help you or not, but, and then I put the little one that I think happens rarely on the bottom because it, yeah. It might not be as well. Okay, how do you get started? Uh, you got to worry about you or your organization, and I'm only going to talk about the organization. The way you get started is to be inspired and read the books and find a project and get your org to do it. It is nicest if there is C-level funding and endorsement and a forcing function. There is no question about that. It is an org change. It takes time. Because it's a transformational change, you will have failures. And because of that, it's really nice to have C-level support, right? CIO or CEO, CFO, right? You want chief whatever it is support. Make sense? The higher up you go. That's what I mean by C-level. So, um, and funding. It's not so bad either. <laughs> we like funding. Um, now, it turns out, I think it's more likely that you're not going to get that. Now, I was really frustrated the other day because I was at this panel discussion. I was not a part of the panel. I was watching it. And the people were asking, well, in my org, how do I start DevOps? And essentially, they said, well, you got to start at the C-level or you can't make progress. And I just wanted to slap them. No, it's not true. In a, in a, in a virtual way, not a physical way. Um, and so, so I was like, no, 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 that's not, you can't, no. You can't wait for that. You will, you'll, you'll die and, and you'll lose your job because your company will die. So don't do that. Um, rather, PowerShell is all bottoms up driven, almost all, not always. But I would say nine tenths of the time, PowerShell gets embedded in an organization because somebody goes to one of these conferences and says, oh, this is kind of cool. I wonder what I can do, right? They do something, they show value, and somebody goes, oh, that's kind of valuable. I wonder if my org could use that, right? And you get another sponsor of PowerShell, and that's the way it grows. It grows organically from you guys. DevOps happens the same way. It is, in my mind, a bottoms-up, success-driven adoption, right? And those are important words. It's bottoms-up. It starts with people who actually do things. It's got to be success-driven because otherwise, if you, if, you, if you spend a lot of time and fail, it's, it's okay to fail on the way to success, but you do have to arrive at success at some point. Right? You can't just arrive at failure after many failures. So you have to arrive at success. It's, it, it's, it's driven there for some reason. Um, and the way to do that is frequently to find what we call the coalition of the willing. They exist in all companies. There are people as crazy as you. They are. They exist out there. You can find them. Just go, you know, look for them. Keep your ear to the ground. You'll find a few people. 
this group here in many ways is a, is, a, is a coalition of the willing. It's just that we're not in the same company. And then the third one, this is important because I didn't have this one as in focus, and um, Steve Morosky actually pointed out to me. They said, hey, look, um, what's also important, because you want to have this success-driven adoption, it's important to go find an impactful place. See what project would get the most value by that rapid, high velocity and high quality and would be, and maybe for the first project, not the most visible, maybe the third visible or something. You know, but your second project, do the most visible. You know, but get something that's high impact. Does that make sense? Where you feel that the technology can make a difference. Because you want to be able to show, in fact, um, a high, high impact demo. And, and it's okay to start with the basic CID, CD stuff. If that's where you're at, let's just start there. Let's just do the Jenkins. Let's do the GitHub. Let's do the, you know, whatever it is you want to do, right? Um, <laughs> was that a public comment or a private one? <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then, uh, you know, do, do config as code. You know, that's a good place to go. And then do infrastructure as code. And then sort of go walk through that whole slide I showed before of, okay, which one of these am I doing? Am I doing the hot analytics? Am I not? Am I doing cold path? How am I handling phases now? Okay, I've, I've got this under my belt. The next step is phasing, flighting. Okay, how do I handle that? Don't try to bite it off at once. Just do something useful. You can have a huge impact with just the basics. And that's all you're trying to do. All you're trying to do is do one thing, have a big impact, and show it. And then people go, oh, I got it. And I, I know that sounds obvious, but it, it gets lost. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of leaning on it. And there's no guarantees it'll work. There are ways for the C-level people to shut you down, even when you're successful, but that's okay. You can find another job. <laughs> you won't necessarily get fired, but by that time, you'll have educated yourself. You'll be actually more valuable. And there are so many people looking for people who understand DevOps. It's crazy. The, the hockey stick in jobs is like, looks like this. We saw it the other day. It looks like, it's just like, yeah, just, it's a real hockey stick. Um, okay. Something else to keep in mind. We're dealing with adult learners, and I'm not quite sure the politically correct term to use. It just means that as adults, we kind of think we understand life and the world around us, and we have a set way of doing things. And what that means is it can be really, really, really frustrating. Somebody just mentioned that to me the other day. Was that, I just, who was, someone mentioned to me the other day, and I love the phrase. It's frustrating to be a beginner again. Right? you got to go all back through it. You're going to fail. You're going to feel kind of stupid because you don't quite get it. As one of, my, uh, one of my friends used to say who was a dancer, you have to go through stupid to get to great. So just realize that you're going to look stupid for a while. It's going to be great. you got the same problem here of just sort of stepping back. It's okay. It's hard. But and it's frustrating to fail. And by the way, it's frustrating to fail while you still got to get your day job done. And so my point with this is not so much about yourself, although it's worth giving yourself that break too, it's also worth giving other people a break around you as you're trying to push them down this place of DevOps. Just be understanding that that's the process they have to go through and tell them they have to go through it, and then that's fine. But at least they know it, they're aware of it. Um, uh, let's see, the other thing is uh, sometimes people just aren't interested. They're COBOL programmers, leave them alone. Just move on, find the coalition, the willing, it's okay. <laughs> um, and then, uh, but this is really important. I, I, can't, I can't overemphasize it, which simply says, I don't care what topology you're using of the ones we said were good, and I don't care what technology you're using. The most important thing you'd start doing is this education and validation. And we're finding that more and more even at Microsoft. These companies are simply coming to us and saying, okay, how do we, we know we got to do something. Help us. Tell us how we do it. Get these people educated. Are there, is there some class I can attend? And, blah, and the answer is yes and no. You know, the real way to do this is to get your feet wet. That's what it is, is to do what we said before with an impactful project. All right. Um, a quick observation. Uh, this is, since I work at Microsoft, thought I would just inform you. Here's the story we wish we could tell. So this is, might give you directional. This gives us directional. We get DevOps. Here's how we do it, and I can show you some of this stuff uh, later on. Well, actually, I won't because I'm running out of time. Uh, here's how I actually do DevOps internally in some elements of our company. And the key is it should be a journey we make easier for you. All right, my summation. DevOps is real. It's going to happen. It's going to either happen with you or to you. <laughs> it, would be, it would be better if it happened with you. That's all I'm saying. 
So be aware of it. At least have an open eye on it, okay? Um, there are some huge benefits for those who participate, and some people will not participate. There will be winners and losers as we go through this in the next 10 years. Okay, if it's not two years, maybe it's five. But there are winners and losers today. You see that, again, Amazon is very much internally does a lot of, a, a lot of similar practices. Google does a lot of these practices, and they're eating other people's lunch. Does that make sense? Ex exchange, O365 is doing the same thing, right? They're succeeding, they'll take people down. If you're not involved and you're competing against someone who is involved in DevOps, you're gonna lose. So you will be impacted at some point. I would assert soon, and you can start now. Consider your team, remember adult loaders, and this is the best part. There's some cool technology here, guys. This is where ops becomes cool, even cooler than PowerShell made it. PowerShell took ops, and, uh, in my opinion, you know, click, 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 and made it really cool. And this this takes it to the next level. It's like, okay, now this is this is neat stuff, right? We get to do a little machine learning, and yeah, we'd like to help. So that's it. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yeah, that's what I meant by adult lunar. I should have said communication. Yes, you're right. I will edit the slide when I go home. Yes. If you gave it to, if this was if this was Ops's code, this is a configuration's code, you could just send it to me and I and check it in, and my slide would be updated. I'd feel better about that. That's right. <laughs> All right. Other questions we had. We have a couple of minutes left. I think I've got like four or five. Nope, going once, going twice. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Is it okay?